everyone. Welcome to your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. I'm Beth McCord, your Enneagram Coach. And at YEC, we desire for you to use the Enneagram so that you can have real and lasting transformation in your life and in your relationships. But we're also deeply committed to training and raising up the next generation of amazing Enneagram coaches. Now, each episode, what we're doing is we're interviewing an amazing guest, but we're also incorporating Enneagram coaching in our conversation so that you can really see how transformative the Enneagram can be when you have a coach. So for those of you that really love Enneagram and you're an Enneagram enthusiast, you think, huh, I'm kind of interested in maybe being an Enneagram coach. Then we suggest that you take our free mini course at your forward slash mini course. But not everybody's in that place. Perfectly fine. But we highly encourage you to get your own Enneagram coach, whether it's for yourself, your marriage, your family, uh, maybe your business. And to do that, we've got many awesome certified Enneagram coaches through our certification program. And you can get yours at myenneagramcoach.com. Again, that's myenneagramcoach.com. Well, Today, we have a very special guest, and I can't wait for you guys to meet him. He's actually been on our uh, show once or twice, but I really just wanted to dive in and talk to him once again because he's just a wealth of information, and this is Chuck DeGroat. And Chuck has been married uh, to Sarah for 29 years and has two amazing daughters. Um, he holds the position of professor of counseling and Christian spirituality, as well as the role of executive director of the clinical mental health counseling program at Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan. Additionally, he serves as the faculty member for Soul Care Institute. Chuck is a licensed therapist, a spiritual director, and the author of five books. He is also an accomplished retreat leader and a sought after speaker. His therapeutic experience lies in the area such as abuse and trauma, pastoral and leadership, well-being, and guiding individuals through tough times of doubt and spiritual darkness in their faith journey. Chuck is also recognized as a minister of the word and sacrament in the Reformed Church in America, having previously served as the pastor in Orlando and in San Francisco, which is where I was born. Uh, his focus has shifted into training and equipping pastors, including specialized training in issues of abuse and trauma. He conducts pastor and planter assessments, leads church consultations, and oversees investigations related to pastoral misconduct and congregational issues. So as you can see, man, he has a wealth of information and experience, which is why I can't wait to dive in and talk to him today. So let me bring him on. Chuck, it's so great to have you on the podcast today. It's great to be here. Thanks for calling me special earlier. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a great place to start. Yes, that's so funny. Yeah, so Chuck is a type four. And of course, he is special and unique to me. And here's how like special and unique you are to me is so we met probably, let me think about it, 2014, 15, in that kind of area. Um, we were going through some really rocky times with Jeff's position um, at a local church. And I was reading your book, Toughest People to Love. And when I was reading it, I was like, oh my word, this is what we're going through. And I need some more advice because we didn't have anyone in our circles to really help guide us or give us any direction or insight. So I contacted you and you were like, yeah, sure, let's let's talk. And so the three of us talked and you gave so much helpful information um, that we needed in that particular season. You were so gracious with your time and your wisdom and your own personal experience. Um, so I just really want to thank you for one, your book and books, um, but particularly that book because of the trajectory that it put Jeff and I on. We wouldn't have been in as much of a healthy spot as we are today because, you know, Jeff being a type six and a loyalist, he probably would have tried to stay put where he was. And you just gave some really clear advice that that was not um, a good decision to make. And that gave him kind of the the confidence and the go ahead to move on and uh, to heal from that experience. So thank you so much for yeah. your time in that. Yeah. I'm so glad we stayed connected over the years and so grateful, so proud of you guys. Look at what you've done. It's incredible. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was courageous uh, of you to step away and to step into this new thing, which is not so new anymore. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. It was, it was new back when I started in 2016 and now yeah. it seems like so many people love the Enneagram, which I obviously yeah. totally understand. Mm -hmm. Um, but with that, so you've written five books, but even one of those books, you incorporated the Enneagram into it. Can you share which book that is and what it's about? Yeah. So that, that's a book called When Narcissism Comes to Church. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about that is uh, I looked back at, at how I was using the Enneagram a long time ago, going back to my, my early years in ministry and, and my early introduction to the Enneagram uh, in terms of its, my understanding of, of the levels of development and pathology when it comes to the Enneagram. And I looked at some Enneagram folks and, and how they understood narcissism uh, Naranjo sees it in the sevens and others see it in other numbers. But I, I really started to see narcissism in and through all nine types yeah. and, and wanted to, to share how that shows up and more at times more grandiose narcissism, at times more, you know, covert narcissism. And so it was a fun little experiment. Uh, and I and I named that going in that this was something that I'd I'd use personally and I'd, I'd vetted with others. But at the same time, I was I was putting my ideas out there. Uh, and, and, uh, it's been well received. I'm thankful yeah. for that. Yeah. And I think that's, and when we talk about any thing, people will say, oh, well, can this be true for this type or that type? And I'm like, all nine types can do mm -hmm. things, certain things. It's just, they're going to do it differently or have a different perspective. And right. so I appreciate that. Now, of course, as a type nine, I'm like, what us type nines can be narcissists. And then I'm like, okay, yeah, I can totally see how we can. It's just the looks so was the different, right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Looks so different. We we could fly under the radar, right? Like we're not mm -hmm. thinking about ourselves, but me yeah. literally avoiding conflict all the time and people pleasing is a way to take yeah. care of myself and focus on myself. Yeah. Um, and sometimes in good ways, but then if it gets unhealthy, um, mm. it's just in a self-preservation mode, not necessarily mm. doing it for the betterment of, you know, those around me. So, um, but yeah, it totally looks different um, in all nine types. Now, yeah. so you wrote that book. Now you have just finished the manuscript of a new book that's coming out in fall of 2024. Right. And what is that about? Yeah. So after writing the narcissism book, I, in some ways I thought I was done. Um, uh, who mm -hmm. wants to hear from a, uh, a middle-aged white guy in his early fifties. Right. Uh, but I was encouraged. You. <laughs> well, good. Thank you for that. I mean, I was encouraged by a, a publisher to, to re-engage and, and part of it was to, to shift the conversation from what happens to you to what happens within you in the mm -hmm. midst of, of the, the pain, the hurt, uh, the abuse that that you experience in life. Uh, some have said trauma is not what happens to you, but what happens within you. And so, yeah. in a sense, I shift to uh, the conversation that we have to have within us. But uh, I take an angle that is born out of work I've done in Genesis 3 and the three questions that God asks in Genesis 3, which I find to be really compassionate and really curious. Uh, where are you? Uh, which gets at how we show up, how we're hiding, um, where we are uh, from a place of connection to disconnection. Who told you? In other words, what's the story you're listening to? Uh, who's been whispering in your ear? And then that third question, have you eaten from the tree? I translate as where have you taken your hunger and your thirst? Uh, and, and that requires us to look at all the very many ways we're uh, self-satisfied, right? That we go about healing our own wounds and self-soothing when God longs to, to care for us. And so um, I'm hoping it'll, it'll be a helpful book, a healing book for people who, who need to shift from, uh, from that focus. You and I experienced some similar things. I mean, I went through a very uh, difficult time in ministry more than 20 years ago now where I, I harped on what happened to me. I couldn't stop thinking about all the bad things that happened to me and how I get justice and I had to transition. And it took about six or seven years until a therapist said, we're not going to talk about all that. We're going to talk about how, you know, the imprint of the wound within you um, and, yeah. and how it feels today. And that's when I started doing the, the healing work. And so I'm excited about it. Thanks for asking. Yeah, no, I'm really excited about it because um, so I've been also learning a lot about CPTSD uh, yeah. kind of goes back to uh, yeah. for me being teased a lot by my older brother. 
And just starting to unpack all of that, yes. um, he and I have a great relationship. I mean, he's a fabulous uh, person, but hey, you know, that was hard when I was growing up. That was hard. Um, but as I, you know, been kind of unpacking that, I remember um, listening to someone and it's just exactly what you were saying. It's that the person was talking about like uh, parenting. And if your kids go through some traumatic experience, it's more about them being able to share and unpack yeah. um, what's going on within them than the actual experience. And the more they have the ability and the, the safe place and the ear to hear, yeah. the more they're going to be able to process through yeah. that trauma versus yeah. it being um, frozen basically. In yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It's all about, uh, having someone bear witness to what you've been through. Um, Bonnie Badenock says trauma is not events. It's being alone in those events. And so it's, it's not, again, it's not what happened to you. It's your sense of aloneness in the midst of that. And so, you know, if, if you go through a hard thing and you have someone show up, ask good questions, pay attention, um, that that's profoundly important. And I think not trying to fix, who, right. Not trying to guide yeah. or steer, just being there. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to be a licensed therapist. You just have to be a kind friend, a compassionate mm -hmm. conversation partner. You know, someone who I tell the story in the book of, of uh, you know, people who go through, let's say a massive hurricane, lose their home and, and uh, end up in a, a home of someone else who's able to sort of sit with them and let them cry and grieve and be seen in that versus someone who goes to a hotel and isolates uh, and numbs, you know, numbs the pain through substances or whatever else. Uh, one, one may come out stressed and hurting. Mm -hmm. The other one will come out with trauma. And so we do have some control over uh, when these things do happen to us, some control over how, how we go about attending to what's happening within and healing mm -hmm. what's happening within. And so that, that's what I discern to be the, the next book and, and the next, mm -hmm. at least, attempt to be helpful in what I, what I have to share. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, okay. So, Hey, let's dive into your Enneagram story yeah. and that journey. So you discovered the Enneagram back in like 1997. So like this was way before yeah. it was popular. Yeah. Um, and it sounded like you discovered pretty quickly that you were a type four, but you also were like, but I don't know this type one thing. I, I resonate with it. Yeah. So, Walk me through that experience and what was the aha moment in where yeah. you actually landed? Yeah, so so it was, uh, yeah, it was back in the late 90s. It was through the, uh, through some of Richard Rohr's work, I think, um, originally that that I, I got into it, found it fascinating. And, mm -hmm. and I was a licensed therapist too. And so I was connecting it to some of that, um, understanding some of the different lenses for psychopathology through the Enneagram. And so... Uh, and ended up teaching a course uh, down at a seminary that I went to uh, and ended up teaching it on vocational counseling where I was using the Enneagram. And you know this, back then there were just so, there were a few tools oh, uh, yeah. and and there's <laughs> really no coaching at the time. And so I was uh, self-taught in it, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd go to small used bookstores and I'd find books by uh, Suzanne Zercher or Don Richard Riso or Helen Palmer or all the, you know, sort of, sort of the old names of the Enneagram yep. and, and just devour them. But, and for, yeah, very early on for me, four resonated, I think a, a basic sense of feeling missed, misunderstood, unseen, uh, a, a deep sense of not enoughness, uh, some of that playing out and that sense of envy, always looking at others with the sense of how come they have everything that I don't have, feeling like um, and I think someone in the Enneagram world once said this a long time ago, but it always resonated, but feeling like I never got the instruction manual of life. Mm -hmm. I was missing something that others had information that I'd never been let in on. And so it was really helpful in my early self-understanding. It was a, a friend of mine in probably 10, 11, 12 years after that, who uh, was observing me and I, I think probably more observing behavior uh, rather than, you know, my heart, you know, my motivations and said, you know, you're a reformer. You're, you know, you're always wanting to change systems. There's a, there's a sense in which you can see what the, the right way is, what should happen. And she was very, very certain I was a one and she had gotten into her own study of the Enneagram. And so my policy with this has been, if, if someone feels that I'm going to try that on for size uh, someone else years later 
suggested that I might be a six. Okay, I'll try that on for size. I'll take six weeks, a couple of months, and just ask myself questions, look at my life story through that lens. But I lived in, in oneness even for a few years, and it just never really felt like home, although there are aspects of, of uh, you know, uh, type one that, that made some sense. So anyway, uh, yeah, four, four feels like home. Um, although, you know, I, I, I can dance a bit in some of the other spaces and places. Uh, and, yeah, then, sure. and then Beast, we, we were all waiting for Beecher's Chestnut stuff back in, in the Bay Area, back in like yeah. 2012, 2011, 2012. You know, she yeah. was beginning to teach, but she hadn't written, uh, I think it was what, the complete Enneagram and, and mm -hmm. waiting on her work on the subtypes, which is really going to you know, uh, tease out Naranjo stuff. And, and uh, that, that became really helpful to sort of home in on self-prez as my subtype. And so we yeah. can talk about that more. You know way more about this stuff than I do. I know <laughs> enough to be dangerous, to be honest. No, that's yeah. great. Yeah. And so for those out there, there is um, so many layers to the Enneagram. Um, I think the gift that I bring to the Enneagram world is I make this complex system easy to understand. Yes. And the the main reason is I just want people to be able to use it quickly. Yeah. You know, some people love to geek out and go, you know, into all of the nuances, which is great. I do too, yeah. but not everybody does. They really want to use this as transformation. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the layers is the instinctual subtypes. And that is where you have, we all use all three, but one reigns supreme. And then the one is like second place. And mm -hmm. then the last one we use the least, um, but there's self-preservation. Uh, social and one-to-one, -one, and some teachers call it sexual because it's about intimacy. Not so much intimacy as in like a um, an actual like uh, sexual relationship as more into chemistry, like feeling connected with someone. Um, so the actual, the instinctual subtypes come first. Um, so if you think about um, the instincts um, as being uh, the light switch in a room and your personality is the wiring, the light switch gets turned on and then the personality goes. So again, there's self-preservation. These are people that are predominantly more focused on their self-preservation. It could be uh, their time management, their food resources, their health, you know, all of those kinds of things. The social is more of the people that are really kind of focusing on, let's say like the herd mentality, like, hey, I want to know who's in my group and we're going to like, we're going to get through life together. And so they're really kind of thinking of this kind of more group mentality. And then the one-to-one -one is like, Hey, you and me, we're, we're going to get through this life together. And that's kind of like your mallard duck per se, <laughs> you know, like we're, we're in this for a lifetime and that's me. I, that's my main subtype. So it's like, Jeff, you and me, we're in this for a lifetime. <laughs> and, and that's actually his too. So we're very, <laughs> For good and not good, we're very focused on each other. Um, but the but what's interesting is that in each of the types, one of these is what they call the counter type. Um, now it's not not all self preservation is a counter type or social. It's different with each of the types, so you have to go learn about it. Go to Beatrice Chestnut's book or some of her podcasts that she has done. She'll kind of tell you all about it. Um, but for yours in particular, the type four. Uh, you resonate more with the self-preservation for now, again, you use the social and you use the one-to-one, -one, but just at a different, in a different way and not as much, but the self-preservation for is the counter type. That's so right. basically it's the type that doesn't look like a four. You yeah. don't always feel like a four. In fact, the, uh, self-preservation for is the lookalike to type one. Yeah. And so when you said that you kind of vacillated between those two, I'm like, totally makes sense. Uh -huh. So the the self-preservation subtype of um four is called tenacity so what's interesting is that this uh type four again like when you're reading about the type four let's say the stereotypical type four you see more of a person that emotes a lot has has wide range of emotions but everyone else can kind of see or feel those emotions but the self-preservation four is actually kind of the opposite mm -hmm. they tend to not wear their emotions on their sleeves as much they're very attuned to their emotions and they do have highs and lows and they're very self-aware, but they tend to hold them inward. Um, and, but they have a lot of tenacity through them. And so this is where a lot of people, like you said, your friend was observing you, your behaviors on the outside and it looked very one-ish, but 
actually what was going on internally, your core motivations were still four. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's so important for everyone to go back to those core motivations when you're typing yourself or helping someone else find their type. Because again, behaviors can give us indications, but it isn't the full picture. Yeah. Um, and so for you as a self-preservation four, my guess is you've kind of grown up all your life having a wide range of emotions, mm -hmm. but a lot of people not knowing it and mm -hmm. then maybe being surprised when they yeah. do kind of pop up and yeah. probably shut you down because you're not playing your typical role. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, hey, don't be too much with those emotions. Right. And yeah. so then it's kind of like, hey, OK, the message I'm getting is I'm too much. And then another message for the four is I'm not enough. And yeah. so therefore you feel misunderstood. Is there something wrong with me? Cause I'm feeling all these emotions, but no one's really wanting to accept them. Mm -hmm. Does this kind of paint a picture for you? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that conflict within that you're naming too, between I'm too much and I'm not enough, I think is an important one for, for most fours. Right. But um, right. for the self-pressed four in particular, and I think probably uh, for most of us who identify as self-pressed, there's some story of, of uh, there was a lot going on. I was feeling a lot within, but I didn't have permission to feel that uh, uh, it, within the care of others. And, and that was the case for me. Um, there, there was a sense in which uh, my mom and dad didn't hold space for those that wide range of emotions that you're describing, right? And so I sort of had to muffle it. Um, some people call uh, self-pressed fours the long-suffering fours. And that word mm -hmm. made a lot of sense to me like just this sense of, of, I just got to hold the pain. Uh, and so there's a deep sense of sort of um, capped frustration, you know, and, and, but on the outside, what's, what can be, and I'm, I'm curious if this is what you see when you see people like me, what's a bit paradoxical is I can come off as kind of funny or lighthearted. Um, I grew up on Long Island during the, you know, but maybe pre Seinfeld days, but like a, a kind of Long Island, New York sense of humor. And then, and then people see this other side of me, which is very, very serious and very emotional and very deep. And they're like, who, who are you? I don't know what to do with these two sides of you, but it's very much this sense of there's a survivor side of me that was funny and light and learned to get along in a, in sort of a tough world, a tough Long Island world. Uh, especially for a male who is a bit more sensitive. So mm -hmm. yeah, is that what you typically see, Beth? Or Yeah, actually a lot of self-preservation for, so on one side, they're a look like to one. So mm -hmm. um, again, the tenacity holding things in type ones will repress their, you know, emotions of especially like anger or anything that they feel is inappropriate in their mind or wrong. Um, so a four can kind of give off that similar vibe, but at the same time, what's really interesting is a lot of self-preservation fours can look like sevens mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, cause they, they tend to put off this kind of sunny disposition around others. Now, maybe not so much in the home. They're much more probably feel more comfortable, yeah. but around others, again, it's another survival strategy, whether they're cognizant of it or not. And it's not that it's bad or right or, or wrong. It's just they learned, hey, I, I can't show all of my cards, especially right. the negative ones. So I'm going to show the other cards I have, which are the positive ones, because I usually get a better response from that. And so that's then kind of played out through life. So I have several people and particularly one really dear friend um, who is a four. But if you were around her without knowing her, you would definitely think she was a seven. Mm. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, it is. I, that, that's a new connection to me, that seven piece. And yet, as soon as you said it, there was a sense of, oh, yeah, of course. Um, now, now th there's no way in my own spirit I feel quite as light as seven seem to feel, right? But, sure. but yeah, totally. it's, it kind of looks like that. And, and so people are like, wow, he's, he's, he's sort of a contradiction. And I wonder. You know, I, I wonder about that that sense of contradiction because you know, in some of my writing, I talk about um, the contradictions of the narcissist, right? The Jekyll and Hyde, and I've I've had to be really attuned and attentive to that, even in my leadership. You know, it, like how do people experience me? It's a question that I ask a lot as as I lead people, um, but in in my family life too. How do you experience me? Because there's a range that can go from kind of brooding and moody 
to light and um, nothing, nothing really matters. So let's just have fun. Right. And that's, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure, I, well, I've been told that can be really uh, uh, confusing for people. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think what's interesting is, you know, kind of when you unpack personalities, it, it can feel at times like, am I not being authentic and real when I'm this way or if I'm that way? Yeah. I think it can all be auth- authentic and real. And at the same time, it can also be a coping mechanism, mm-hmm. a strategy, mm-hmm. just depending on really where we're at in the current moment. Yeah. So there's going to be times where you're doing really well, you know, in your you know, feeling really healthy, you feel very secure, you're very in tune with yourself, and you're fun, you know, and you're lighthearted. Um, But there's also going to be times where when you're not doing as well, you're recognizing the situation at hand that it's not safe Mm -hmm. to display what's really going on. And you know that this has worked. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't mean that in itself is wrong. It's just another tool that you have learned over the years to use. Yeah. I do think it's, and and I think you would agree, I do think it's important for us to know why it's coming up, you know, like, and what's going on. Like, am I doing well? Oh, great. Or I'm not doing so well. And this isn't the person or the place to even unpack that or change it. But I'm going to take note and maybe like talk with that coach or counselor or friend, whoever I have on my team, so to speak, um, to really process, I can tell I didn't feel safe in that situation. And do I need to unpack that some more? So I think that we, I think part, like your ability to be lighthearted in moments is a both and, and it's a gift um, and a strategy. So does that kind of resonate, make sense? Yeah, that's good. And you know, that's, that's really freeing. There's something about that, that I think I, I knew at some level, but again, hearing you say it out loud, there's something about that that's yeah freeing because I think there's also a need for integrity uh, in me and and um, I I did think for a while it's got to be one or the other like my true self right quote unquote right. Um, must either be kind of serious and poetic or you know light and funny and 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 most of the time I think I've dismissed my lighter funnier side as avoidant or uh, a persona of some kind right and just recognizing that there's there's space for for all of this the fullness of of um this wide range of of enneagram fourness and particularly yeah. the self press so yeah what you said is 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 kind of freeing actually yeah exactly um and, and i think that's really great because like for instance when i'm on the podcast or i'm speaking on stage it in some ways is very different than who I am when I'm just hanging out with my family. Like I'm not this lively and vivacious, you know, just hanging out with my family. Yeah. Cause a lot of people go, are you sure you're a nine? You know, like when yeah. I'm on stage or I'm on the podcast. Yeah, right. Sure. And I'm like, Oh yes, trust me. I'm yeah. a nine. I know that, you know, I look very social, but I'm actually, I wouldn't say super introverted, but I am yeah. more introverted than I'm extroverted. Um, and so I wrestled with it too. I was like, is there, is there something like, am I, am I not showing up as my true self when I'm doing these things? And actually I feel almost more true to who I am when I'm on the podcast and speaking in front of people or teaching. Um, and so I asked, um, Patsy Claremont, she was kind of coaching me when I was beginning to speak. Um, and she's a four Mm. and, when she's at home, she's very four-ish, you know, yeah. but when you see her on the stage, she is so funny, yeah. like so funny. So a lot of people would think that she's a seven. I was just asking her about it. And she said, Beth, that is me and who I am at home is me. So what I learned from Patsy is that, you know, who I am on stage and who I am at home, those are both me. What I need to focus more on, this is actually, you know, what we write in our books and pretty much everything I do. The biggest thing is recognizing, am I in a healthy place, an autopilot or average place or an unhealthy place? And the Enneagram is so great at helping us to recognize what's going on under the hood, so to speak. And when I am struggling, the problem, I think, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, just being a counselor, professor, professor of counseling is most of us, especially when we're reading the Enneagram, when we read about our type, we hone in on the worst parts of us. And we just are like, see, I'm unhealthy or see, I'm under stress or this. And then we just want to unpack or belittle ourselves or shame ourselves or go get help. And of course, we all should go get help when we need help. But do you find that people really kind of hone in and fixate on maybe the less healthy aspects of them and think it's actually 
bigger or worse than maybe what it is? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's interesting with the Enneagram, right? Because um, uh, p some people see it as any other kind of personality test, you know, where yeah. they, they, they want to home in on, on the positives. Um, and I do think that the great um, benefit of the Enneagram is it, is it allows us to, to see that range. I think it was, I mean, early on for me, I think it was Riso and Hudson's levels of development, you know, those nine levels that allowed me to see, okay, there's this range of health to unhealth that uh, as a four, um, I, I sort of fit within this particular range and I can see myself on my least healthy days operating kind of down here at a, maybe a five. Um, and on my most healthy days at like a two or a three, I'll maybe not all the way up to a one, but, but that's one of the advantages I think of the Enneagram, right? Um, yes. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question, if that's quite no, where yeah. you're it, but yeah. So I feel like, so a lot of the work that we do is I definitely want people to be very aware of the reality of where they're currently at. So, Hey, if you're like, again, you said there was nine levels of health, one being the healthiest nine being very unhealthy, pathological. Like, <laughs> yeah, pathological, yeah. unhealthy. Um, I want people to be in reality of where they're at, yes. but I guess this comes more from a coaching perspective. So I'll let you speak from a counseling perspective is I want them to know that there's always hope and a path of growth or a path of getting help. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that is just self-work or understanding themselves better, moving towards those healthy dynamics and aspects. And of course, then if we bring in the gospel, it's really believing and trusting their identity in Christ and having the Holy Spirit work in and through them. Yeah. But it's usually, a, I would say, paired with, again, a coach, a spiritual director, a counselor, right. depending on the level of need and what the need is. Um, but I think that to me, it's so important for people to understand the level of health they're at. So for instance, like you were saying, Hey, you know, like this seven like quality that I bring, is that like normal or what? It's like, yeah, it totally is normal. And it can be a very healthy thing for a, a self-preservation for yeah. if you were in that space. And it can also be a coping strategy if you're not doing so well. But it, again, yeah. I think the biggest thing I want for people to recognize is it's, we don't need to use it as a tool of shame. Yeah, We want to use it as a tool of awareness and yeah. to then go get the correct help yeah. or guidance that we need to then yeah. move in the healthier direction. Yeah. I think that's really what I would be saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And then I think from a sort of a counseling perspective, it's interesting because I think one of the most helpful things about the Enneagram early on is it helps make sense out of your story. Mm -hmm. And so for me to experience that sense of feeling misunderstood or not enough um, sort of grasping for that enoughness, um, the need to be seen, the need to be special, um, seeing things in other people that I, I felt like I was missing in me and, and craving those things. The, the Enneagram was able to sort of identify that. The fourness was able to sort of identify that. Um, and then, you know, it, I, I didn't know what the word equanimity meant when I, you know, when I first started learning about the paths of growth, you know, so I, I go from a four to a one. What does that mean? Do I need to be more perfect, more right? Like what? Um, <laughs> right. And I, by the way, I, I'm going to, I want to give you space to address that. Like, what does that mean? But uh, as a therapist, I, I began to see, and, and this has really helped me in the last 10 years or so, that there was a kind of dysregulation, an autonomic nervous system dysregulation that existed within me uh, for years and years and years. And the movement to the one, at least for me, uh, one of the lenses became a movement from dysregulation to regulation, to soothing, to a sense of at-homeness in my own body, where from that place, I could recognize my emotions, but not become my emotions, you know? And so I could speak on behalf of my emotions from a place of calm, center. Uh, and, and I wonder if that corresponds with your understanding of a movement from a four to a one or equanimity, uh, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. And just to be very clear, because I'm going to say something and people are going to try to like hone in on it or grab it. I do not believe Jesus was one of the nine personality types. He is Jesus Christ. You know, he is God, you know, almighty, yeah. though he does demonstrate all nine aspects and, and behaviors and tendencies. Yeah. And he gives us examples of what each of the nine types can represent in, in the healthiest form. Mm -hmm. So when we look at 
his emotional um, expression, he is very expressive of his emotions, Mm -hmm. highs, lows, you know, his temper in the, in the temple. Um, I mean, it's so amazing, Chuck, you know, here he is, he knows exactly what's going on, what's going to happen. He goes to the tomb of Lazarus and, you know, everyone is just falling apart, which they should. Mm-hmm. You would think he'd be like, hey, guys, if, 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 me as a nine, I would have been like, hey, guys, it's fine. Like, it's going to be good. Like, don't be sad, you know. Yeah. But he allowed people to express themselves even to the point where he was fully expressing his sorrow and sadness of the situation. And yet he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So he demonstrates that understanding highs and lows and expressing them and being in that moment is important. But then you get even into the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a beautiful moment. He was deep in distress to the point where he's, you know, shedding blood when he's sweating. So he's under such distress, but yet still perfect. And so what you see is this person having equanimity, meaning emotional regulation, what that means is it's not negating the emotions. It's not pushing them aside or suppressing them. It is living through them, but with a full understanding and a, in a healthy way of what you need to do with that. And so here he is, he's crying out to his father. Hey, if you can take this cup from me, please do. And I will follow your will. Mm-hmm. And so I think he demonstrates such a beautiful aspect of what at what equanimity is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so ob- obviously we all need to follow that footstep, but I think that's a great picture for the type four of what yeah. it looks like, because I think when type fours usually hear equanimity, um, emotional balance, typically, cause I think the world says this to them is, Oh, that means you need to get rid of your emotions. That's right. like, yeah. Oh my gosh. No, don't, don't yeah. get rid of your emotions. They're beautiful. They're, they're needed. We need that that beautiful representation, the creativity, really just the word beauty encapsulates to me the four is, and beauty is a wide range of things, right? You know? Um, And so I would say, you know, for the fours, have your emotions, but also when you move to that type one, the healthy type one, what does it look like to be able to be grounded and principled and in a sense still um, or in reality while also experiencing your emotions. Cause a lot of times for fours, they're going to go off into some sort of fantasy imagination. Yeah. It's going to pull them out of reality and they start to believe that that is actually what's really happening. So it's yeah. important. It's for the four to recognize, okay, wait, I don't want to get into imagination. I don't want to get into what could be, but what is actually happening now and how can I feel and work through that? Does that resonate? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And and um, not losing yourself in fantasy, I mean, really, really resonates, particularly for a younger me, that uh, th- because the present was probably too painful in some ways for fours. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I, it's a way to escape. Yeah, right. yeah that's really I good. Like to, um, I would love to hear from you being a male four. And I think you had said uh, being an HSP, highly sensitive mm-hmm. person. Can you walk us through, because I'm sure there's a lot of young men out there, and this kind of falls into the category of type twos and probably type fours more than any of the other types. Not that the other types can't feel this way, but as a man who is highly sensitive, can you just unpack what it's meant for you to learn about being a four and a highly sensitive person? And then what have you, how have you used that information for your own personal self-growth? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, in many ways now, of course, I, I wish I knew this about myself when I was young, particularly, again, growing up on Long Island uh, it, it was tough. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, my my friends were demonstrative and loud. And, you know, I, I used to have the thick New York accent back in the day. I mean, it, and it was um, my sister still lives there. My sister is demonstrative and loud. And 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 yet from my earliest days, I felt different. Right. I, mm-hmm. I just felt like I could not keep up. Uh, I didn't fit in. Uh, I didn't really belong. Um, and things impacted me, like how loud people were in my house when we had guests over and there was the pasta flowing and and loud New York accents. And I just wanted to go hide in my room uh, or crawl under a bed or or. Uh, 
And and I remember there are times where I would uh, I'd be on the couch uh, pretending I was napping, um, but probably off away in my head in some distant place, uh, j just trying to escape. Um, and and that impacted me in in my early days in particular. Uh, really shy, sensitive, uh, even in terms of like loud noises and and um, clothes and different materials that my mom would put on. You know those kinds of things that HSPs typically. Uh, identify with. What's interesting, uh, and, and I'll, I'll keep this short, is, is uh, when I first got into therapy, um, based on my story, therapists thought there has to be some sort of really significant abuse in this guy's past. And um, when we talk about uh, HSP, high sensitivity, we're talking more about a trait than uh, something that emerges out of uh, the pain of life or some sort of suffering. And so there's something about that that was really freeing to say, OK, there's there's something about this cocktail here. You know, I, I think there's a mystery with the Enneagram, you know, is people want to know, is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it your story or is it your biology? All that kind of stuff. Um, there's something in the cocktail that I think I was desperate to figure out early on. Did something really bad happen to me to make me this way? And I've I've come to this place of of, yeah, there were some things that were tough, but I, but I was also born into the world with this capacity and it's really a beautiful capacity for sensitivity. Um, it wasn't taught to me as a beautiful thing, but it's something that I've come to sort of cherish about myself and it's a gift that I can bring to the world too. And so, uh, yeah, the four and the high sensitivity sort of merged together in, in a beautiful way, uh, that became very helpful. Yeah. And, and at least I'm going to guess, and you can kind of tell me if I'm right or wrong, but it is an overflow of your books, like the the sensitivity, the pain that you've gone through, recognizing mm -hmm. it, your own story, also yeah. the work you've done really comes comes through your books, at least from what I have read and knowing a little bit you know, about you personally. Is that true? Yeah, yeah I think so. I mean, I think um, the first one in particular was probably the one that fused the fewest number of people know about because it was from the small imprint. I wasn't looking to get published, but um, I was trying to make sense of the counseling journey and the discipleship journey, the formation journey through the story of the Exodus and um, spent years and years um, looking at that story as, as um, not just for what happened, but as this metaphor of our lives, this movement from Egypt to the promised land. And, um, in some ways, I still think some of my best writing was in that and some of my most beautiful sort of writing was in that. And it was deeply personal um, and metaphorical. And, and you know, there's a lot of imagery and story like, yeah, there, there there was that. And then and then there were it's interesting in, in one story, there are attempts to kind of um, I wanted to show certain competencies and toughest people love. Like, I know what I'm talking about, about mental health counseling categories, you know, and um you know, so th there, there are always aspects of yourself that come out in other ways and other writings. Uh, the narcissism book was not a book I wanted to write, intended to write. Um, it was really asked of me by others, uh, pastors in particular, like, please write something that would be accessible. And I hoped it would go away as soon as it came out. Like I hoped I, I did a podcast with you as soon as COVID began. I remember that and thinking, I just hope that I don't have to talk about this book you know, after two months. And it turned out to be probably my worst writing and the most popular book. <laughs> well, it's the biggest so, probably pain point, I guess, you know, people are really resonating or there's yeah. pain point and you're, you're touching on a lot of things anyway. You know, yeah. and I totally know what you mean though. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting though, just to get back to what you asked, like I, I, I decided if I'm going to write something my next book is I'm going to come back home and, and interesting that's in the subtitle, but I, I'm going to come back home to myself um, and ask myself what, what would be, what would be writing that would come from deep, deep places within me. Right. And, and I wanted it to be my very best writing. I was really committed to the beauty of the writing, the storytelling yeah. and, and telling more of my own story than I ever have before. And so that was, I think in some ways, that, that too was, um, maybe that's just maturity. Maybe that's part of that. It's just growing up, but, but like, um, uh, it was, I want to offer something beautiful, not just something that I, I can talk about because I know a little something about narcissistic pathology. 
you know? <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah, you know, I can totally, totally resonate, you know, with that. And I always thought, you know, like the um, musicians, you know, like a band, you know, they have like, you know, a really big hit. Sometimes it's not like their favorite song, but no. everyone wants them to play that song yeah, every time right, that they're right. on stage. That's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, well, the last thing that you had um, kind of shared was, okay, I'm a self-preservation four. It's the counter type. I'm highly sensitive person. So what's the growth path look like? Is it maybe I'm putting words into your mouth, but is it different than the four or what's going on? Is that kind of, can you just kind of share a little bit more about what you were um, proposing with that? Yeah, no, I think you, you hit on it. Um, I mean, I, I do think that the, I'm a lifelong learner, right? And so there are these new, newly integrated kind of concepts over the years that I wasn't thinking about quite as much in terms of my own story of internalized trauma, in terms of my own self-understanding around HSP, um, integrating that with with the Enneagram and, and trying to understand the path of growth. And um, and then, of course, the subtypes were were pretty, pretty big, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, understanding it's a counter type, because that too, for a four, uh, when, when everyone's telling you, uh, well, you should be more, if you were four, you'd be way more emotional, way more romantic, way more poetic, way more this. And I'm, I'm not even enough to be a four. <laughs> so, um, so I, I was, yeah, I, maybe part of the curiosity is the path of growth for this, the, um, instinctual subtype of, of self-preservation for four, right? Like, um, what have you seen there? Um, and, and I, I guess another piece of the question is, uh, uh, I only know women who are self pres fours. And so here I am, a, a guy who identifies as HSP, who's a self pres four. Like, what have you seen, Beth? Yeah. Oh, tell me. Well, yeah. So, our pastor up in Illinois, I don't know if you know uh, Dr. Bob Smart, um, but he's a self preservation four. So, um, oh, he's just, he's amazing. He's amazing. And, um, but, and I would just say, you know, our audience, just to kind of give you a heads up, is probably 85% women. And yeah. obviously the world population isn't 85% women. Yeah. So I think, you know, and, and you see this all the time, I'm sure in counseling, the majority of the people that come yeah. are women. So the, the majority of the people that are engaging with the Enneagram are going to be more women. Therefore, probably you're going to hear or see more of that. Um, and probably a lot of guys, they don't even know maybe to look at the the four, especially self-pressed four, because they're probably going to say that they're a one or hmm. possi possibly even the seven. Um, and so I think that's, that's pretty easy to miss type. Um, I think you're very self-aware. And so you knew, no, I'm a four. I just am a little different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm unique as the four. Um, and so I think, you know, that, that is just very normal. Um, but when it comes to growth path, uh, for the self-preservation for, you know, I think the big thing I would say is, and I think, it, and I'm not saying this necessarily to you, cause I know I'm pretty sure you are already doing this, but I think there's going to be a lot of self-preservation fours that haven't found a safe place to share mm -hmm. their emotions, to share their life, to, to share their traumas whether big or small. So like you said, you're, you're like, I'm trying to find like what big trauma there was, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's not that there was a big trauma per se. I, I hold the belief that God created us our type. And then, so it's nature and nurture. So it's yeah. like nature first and your story plays a huge role in how healthy un to unhealthy you're able to utilize that type. Right. So like if you are born in a family that is very self-aware and is able to help with self-regulation and their strong attachments and all those things, you're going to get a lot of, let's say, tools to put in your mm -hmm. uh, tool uh, yeah. vest. And, you know, you're going to have a lot more things to self-regulate and to understand yourself. Yeah. But there's some people that really have gotten nothing. And then they grew up in a very dysfunctional family and it's going to, not that they can't, they can totally learn. That's why they come to people like you mm -hmm. or coaches. Um, so it's possible, but it's just going to take a lot longer of a time. And so I think for you, you have found those safe people to express yourself, to, to walk through things, to understand the emotional range that you have. Um, and 
like you were saying a second ago, to understand when you're moving into fantasy or imagination of a lot of times what fours will do is they'll imagine what people are thinking or feeling about them and actually think it's real. And then they start to have a push pull in their yeah. relationship. And so I think the biggest thing is recognizing what I usually tell people, you know, the Enneagram is like an internal GPS. So your main type is your current location and then you have a healthiest destination, but we tend to veer off course often. And so we want to set up those rumble strips within us, these alert systems. So like when you're on the highway, you start to veer off course and you want that rumble strip on the side of the highway to alert you. So you get back on path. The problem is growing up, we just veered right off. Like we didn't pay attention that there was a rumble strip. And then we land in that common pitfall and we throw our hands up in the air and we're like, what, what just happened? Like, how did I get here again? Like, and then as we get older, we're like, wait, I knew that this was a bad idea. Why did I do it again? And so then we start shaming ourselves and putting ourselves down. But it's because we haven't usually taken the time to literally put in the rumble strips in our life to alert us. So when a type four can become more self-aware of veering off into imagination or fantasy and pretty much assuming other people's thoughts and feelings about them, which actually aren't necessarily valid, they could be, but they yeah. haven't validated them. Um, they haven't asked those questions. And so then they live in that world. Well, that can then really kind of get you into that common pitfall of withdrawing, isolating, or pushing that relationship aside. Um, it can get into the unhealthy two space, you know, of um, manipulation and garnering kind of a, a martyr-like syndrome. Mm -hmm. So, but once we kind of know what that can look like, we, what we want to do is, is to, especially when we're in that pitfall to look back and go, I wonder where the rumble strip was in this whole situation. Cause there, it was, it was there, it was somewhere. When could yeah. I have recognized that aha moment to then alert myself, just like when we're on the highway, hopefully everyone's doing this. When you hit the rumble strip, you gently steer yourself back into the healthy lane. Yeah. Um, you don't need to, you don't need to jerk the wheel so hard that you're going in the opposite direction too much. You don't need to overcorrect. Yeah. You just need to help self-regulate, self-understand. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that's actually having people around us to help us to navigate that in a way that's safer, yeah. more self-regulating, calm, attaching. Um, so for the self-preservation for, I think a lot of it is going to be um, one, just recognizing what those warning signs are for the self-preservation for in particular, which is, am I holding on to my emotions and not feeling safe to express them to someone that I can trust that right. can understand me? And I think that is the path to a lot of growth for the self-preservation for is to find that person. It can be a friend, it can be a spouse, it can be a coach, a spiritual director, a counselor. There's lots of resources out there but you want to find someone that can understand the four and not try to convert the four into something different. We want them, to, this person to hold space for the four to be all that they are and to celebrate who God has created them to be and to be able to listen. And I think that can be challenging, not because the four themselves are challenging, but because not all the nine types are willing or able or wanting to hold a wide range of emotions that the four um, okay. is was created to express. And so you want to find someone that can hold that range yeah. of emotions. Does that feel true and real yeah. for you? Yeah, so true. Yeah. And, and, and I think where, where we can be self-sabotaging is no one will ever be able to hold that wide range of emotions. Right. And so um, I know I've, I've had to um, not just have grace for myself, but for others to, to say, um, okay, so I may come away feeling misunderstood and it doesn't mean that that it's not a judgment. It's not an indictment on them. It's, th this is a story that's been deep in my bones for a long, long time. And, um, and it's simply moving toward another and beginning to connect and open myself up to being mm -hmm. vulnerable and known, um, just like in this space. I mean, it's, it's been beautiful to sit with you and to have you sort of, I mean, here we are just sort of doing it on the fly in a, in a podcast, right? But I, and I, I, and you know this, I mean, I've worked with the Enneagram in some way or another for 25 years and yet to learn so much in a short period of time. So thank you, Beth. Really <laughs> helpful. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's, what's amazing with the fours, and I love that you said that because 
I would say actually to all fours, hey, when you go get a coach or when you get a counselor or a friend or a spouse, whoever it is that you're opening up to, I think you just need to know that when you walk away, you're always to some degree going to feel like they didn't fully understand you. That's right. And that's okay. Now that's a bummer, right? Because we we long for as long to be fully understood and to feel that they belong. And that's where Christ comes in. So we do, we are, we do fully belong. Mm. And yet we're still longing to fully belong because we're waiting for heaven. So it's like a both yeah. and. Yeah. And so yeah. I think recognizing the reality of living on this planet on mm. this side of the fall you're going to walk from away from the best counselors and the best coaches or whoever it is with that same feeling, but that doesn't negate the good that came out of it and the good that that person did. Now, hey, there's going to be, you know, I, would, I don't want to say that every person they've that Forrest talked to is good. You, you need to definitely be very aware that maybe someone is way off base and you need to avoid them for sure. But if you've walked away and you're like, man, that really felt good and yet... I still feel like they didn't fully understand me. There's more that we need to unpack or there's like, that is perfectly normal for a four to experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and maybe even like at some level befriend, like it's, it's okay. It's um, I think what you're saying is beautiful because it's, there is a, there is even an eschatological component to this. It's now and not yet this living in the in-between this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, and uh and, and, uh, but it, it feels good. Like even in this time together, just to reflect back to you, like being with you, I think there's something very satisfying, I suspect for every Enneagram type, but for fours, just to feel seen or known or to, you know, to be attuned to, which, um, which is, uh, like deep, deeply helpful to, I think, at least for me, this four soul. Mm, I love yeah. that. Thank you so much. Well, it has been such a joy to have you on and to see you again, to talk. Yeah. I'm- so excited for the next book to come out. I know it's going to be in a year, but I'm going to get it whenever it's like, so you got to let everyone know when it's pre-order, I'm on it um, yeah. all the way. So thank you for yeah. just the work that you have done. Um, again, it's immensely been helpful for yeah. me um, and those that I love. Yeah. Um, let everyone know like where they can find you in your work. Yeah. Well, first, thank you. I mean, y- you guys are who I refer people to, to, get their coaching training and to oh, learn more about the Enneagram. And it's, um, I just trust you so much, uh, in your, in this work and, uh, your integrity in, in it, your knowledge, your, um, your heart for people. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank to you. find me, um, at Chuck DeGroat across the socials, uh, Twitter or X, uh, uh <laughs> Instagram threads, Facebook. Uh, my website is www.chuckdegroat.com. Uh, dot net. And so that would be uh, the place to find me there. And then I teach at Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan. So uh, if you feel like moving to this beautiful uh, geography that we inhabit up here and doing a counseling degree or some sort of other master's degree, come find me. It'd be yeah. great. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a beautiful place, especially when the tulips come out, right? Oh, uh, well, yeah, it's that's yeah. Like May. May to May to August, May to September. It's particularly <laughs> beautiful. And then the days darken. But I mean, there's a glare today. I, I didn't realize that I would have this glare. I mean, the sun is out. You know, we we have less sun than Anchorage, Alaska during the winter months. And so, no way. so I, I actually don't mind the glare and the blue skies today. Uh, oh, absolutely. Soak dark. it up. Yeah. Soak it out. Oh, yeah. Well, again, thank you so much, everyone. Go get his books, uh, engage with him. Um, I know you have a newsletter that you put yeah. out. Guys, I, I cannot recommend more highly Chuck DeGroat. So thanks, Chuck, for being with us. Yeah, thanks, Beth. Well, that was so much fun having Chuck DeGroat here with me. I hope that you guys really enjoyed that. And just a sneak peek behind the curtains as a coach, um, I was listening to a lot of really just neat things that he was saying, um, but I also knew he was kind of like, hey, is a growth path any different? And so I just wanted to highlight for him some of the things like those rumble strips that we can put um, in our life, those alert systems of, hey, you know, these things are happening. I I can feel myself kind of holding back or resisting my emotions. And again, not to bring it into shame, um, but as an awareness, do I need to actually express myself with someone? Do I need to 
um, have a place that I feel safe and feel like I belong. So those are kind of some things that I was really highlighting, but Chuck is just such an amazing friend and author and speaker. I hope you guys really engage with his work. Um, and like you saw, like he was really enjoying that conversation. And, and that's a lot of times what coaching is like, where we really mirror back or give some insights, but then what we want you to unpack your story. We want you to think about what is the best path of growth for you? So um, it is a, you know, we're going to walk side by side with you. If you're looking for an Enneagram coach, we have so many great Enneagram coaches that have gone through our training and you can find one at myenneagramcoach.com. That's myenneagramcoach.com. Now, some of you are like, man, this sounds so awesome. I'd love to be a coach. Then get our free mini course at your Enneagram forward slash mini course and see what it's like. We'd love for you to engage in that. Um, we also have our certification program called become an Enneagram coach that we'd love for you to, par to participate in. Um, so take that mini course and check it out. We'd love for you to join. Now, as always, remember that the Enneagram reveals your need for Jesus, not your need to work harder, because it is the gospel that transforms us. Thanks again for joining me today. I look forward to the next conversation I have with a very special guest, and I hope you'll join me there. Until then, we'll see you later.